One of the first things I've tried to do in each case where I have several defendants is, is to see if I can get the defendants to agree on a lead defense counsel who will coordinate with the other counsel. I have a case in the vitamin antitrust litigation where I have over, I think the last time we counted about 85 certificates of service that have to go out every time I sign an order. They have some coordination responsibility so that they try to present what they can in a unified motion and what they can is separate motions. Judge Hogan in his vitamin case has recently uh, implemented uh, notifying counsel by email. Now we have a system that is working wonderfully where I've got counsel to stipulate that they can get notice of the court's actions when I send an order and issue an opinion by uh, an email that we send out from the clerk's office and then they have the obligation to go to our internet web page. On that there is a link that says vitamin antitrust case and they hit that and up comes all the orders and all the opinions and the most recent one. We now do not spend all day sending out copies of orders. In a multi-defendant case I have found it very successful to use a jury questionnaire especially if it's going to be a lengthy trial. Then you go to your normal voir dire process once they're in but the jury you get in if you do that process is knows they're going to be here for two months and is already cleared for that and that then saves you days of voir dire questions. In almost every case where I've done this I've been able to do the jury selection in two days or less. We have a case going on right now where we have three defendants. They're all Spanish speaking, but we also have to take into, logist into account the logistics involved with that. In most instances, you'll notice that courtrooms were not designed with interpreters in mind. I've had a courtroom deputy who sat in a trial recently with nine defendants, and he was really exhausted towards the end of the case, and just keeping him re energized is a major concern of an operations manager. The judge cannot sit back during a long trial. The judge has to be on top of everything that goes on. And she or he has to have their antennae up in that courtroom at all times. Because with that many parties, something invariably uh, can happen. They have to be alert. Uh, if you're not, something can happen in the courtroom that wouldn't ordinarily happen in a regular case. But it, because there's so many defendants, you have to pay attention. If you combine these techniques along with good organization and with good court and technology, working with your court staff, your court deputy, with your systems people in the technology area and the jury people, you can put together a, a case in a reasonably decent time frame. This segment deals with the challenges that court staff face and the effective practices that courts have utilized during trial in a multi-party case. Our second panel consists of Colleen Ligas, who we've already met, Angela Cesar Mobi, Mobley, Operations Manager of the U.S. District Court in the District of Columbia, and Jim Woodward, Clerk of the U.S. District Court, Eastern District of Missouri. And as in the first session, we'll turn to a few push-to-talk courts for their thoughts. Okay, Angela, let's uh, start with you, please. In the video clip, reference was made to the use of a lead defense attorney. Uh, how does that impact the challenges you face uh, in the courtroom as, a, uh, uh, as an operations manager? Well, as an operations manager, it makes the job of a courtroom clerk a lot more manageable um, because a lot of times the lead counsel will file the motions and then co-counsel adopts the motions. Therefore, as a courtroom clerk, you have less motions that you need to keep track of. Also, um, lead counsel will take the responsibility of notifying chambers, like usually before 8 o'clock in the morning, to let chambers know that they will have preliminary matters that need to be addressed before the jury can come into the courtroom. This gives the courtroom deputy time to get prepared for the day. Now they don't have to run around and find out from the attorneys if they have matters that need to be taken care of before the judge takes the bench. Also, um, when objections uh, come from lead counsel, uh, it helps the courtroom clerk because she now doesn't have to uh, make space for all of the attorneys to approach the bench because with the electronic courtroom we can uh, make sure that the attorneys have headphones and they can listen to what's going on at the bench from counsel table. So you can actually focus your resources elsewhere, right? That's right. Um, with having lead counsel, our resources are focused on other things such as ordering jury snacks, uh, making sure our jury has everything that they need, um, assisting the attorneys with uh, using the equipment in the electronic courtroom, and just focusing on our exhibits. Colleen, does it work the same way in your court? 
Bob, not all the cases we handle have a designated lead counsel. Um, however, in cases with a large number of parties, such as an environmental case, that might be an issue uh, the judicial officer may consider at its initial conference. Sometimes the parties may agree amongst themselves um, and designate a lead attorney on their own uh, to handle mm -hmm. uh, matters before the court. However, a lead attorney in, in a multi-party case has its advantages, such as a time saver. When lead counsel um, has been designated, it's much easier to convey the information that the judge wants to give the parties, say to two or three attorneys, versus having to um, advise 20 different attorneys 20 different times the same information uh, that the judge wants them to have. And anyone who knows um, the duties of a courtroom deputy can agree that time is a precious commodity. Oh, yeah. Jim, is that also an effective practice uh, utilized in the Eastern District of Missouri? Well, I agree that it can be uh, a useful technique to use in a multi-party case, and I think that our judges in the Eastern District use it occasionally, but it, it's still a fairly uncommon practice. Although, just a recent example is one of our judges has an admiralty case with about 475 parties and 60 or 70 attorneys, and that is an instance where appointment of a lead attorney has made a lot of sense. Uh, it's actually a, a group of attorneys who are serving in the capacity of lead counsel and they are assisting in the management of the pretrial discovery process and they'll help coordinate exhibits and, and matters like that prior to trial. But I think there's a legal hurdle that occurs very often in multi-party cases that makes appointment of lead counsel sometimes troublesome. Uh, it is very often the case that defendants um, may have inconsistent legal positions in the case, inconsistent defenses. Uh, even worse, they may have cross claims against each other, and it may make mm -hmm. it very impractical for the judge to expect them to cooperate very well in the pretrial stage. Yeah. So it becomes a, a, a delicate judicial determination in some of those that's instances. A, that's a real good point, in fact. Uh, uh, Colleen, what about the distribution of orders in a multi-party case? Do you distribute it to all the parties or only to the lead defense attorney? Well, when we're distributing orders in a multi-party case, all the parties get served with the order. However, if there is a lead counsel in a particular action, then I would contact that counsel, convey the necessary information that needs to be disseminated to the parties, and, that, and now the responsibility shifts from me to his or her, um, who's the lead counsel in the case, to relay that information mm -hmm. uh, the judge wants the parties to be informed about. Angel, I understand you have a different practice in the District of Columbia. It, it's just a little different. Um, if we have a judge that enters an order late in the evening, um, when the clerk gets in first thing in the morning, she will contact uh, lead counsel, and then lead counsel will um, get all the details of the order and co contact co-counsel just as it's done in Colleen's court. But um, the one thing that is very helpful, sometimes when our judges enters an order late in the evening, they will have their chamber staff contact the attorneys and then they'll e either fax it to them or tell them the, uh, the logistics of the order. So um, with Lee Counsel, it does give us, uh, gives us spare time to do other things. Mm -hmm. Let's talk. To, uh, let's ask the same question to one of our push to talk courts, the District Court in, in New Jersey. Uh, do you designate a lead uh, attorney when involved in a multi-party case, and how do you handle noticing and the distribution of orders? Kent Marshall, I believe you're out there. Yes, we are, Bob. I'd like to turn that over to Kelly Miller, who's a courtroom deputy for Judge Cooper with this court. Great. Hi, Hi everyone. Uh, it is not our practice to appoint lead counsel here. Uh, we do appoint them, however, in class action suits and some consolidated actions. Uh, lead counsel is responsible for mailing the notices, the orders, and coordinating a discovery plan. Uh, in those cases, we do not appoint counsel. It is the clerk's responsibility to, ha to mail out all notices to the parties. Uh, although counsel is not formally appointed at trial, uh, we do find that the more seasoned attorneys will assume the lead role. Thank you so much. Uh, Angela, what about the use of email noticing? Um, uh, Judge Hogan mentioned it in the little clip we uh, just saw. How does yeah. that work? Well, as Judge Hogan mentioned, he does uh, currently have a multi-district litigation case with approximately 85 attorneys. And um, our systems office has prepared a master list. And then his courtroom clerk will email the attorneys, uh, informing them that an order uh, has been signed and will appear on the website. And then the attorneys can go on the website and review the order and then act upon the order from the website. Um, this, as Judge Hogan mentioned, saves a lot of time. The clerk doesn't have to stand at the Xerox machine and do tons and tons of Xeroxing and uh, has saved a lot of trees in the District of Columbia also. <laughs> well, that sounds like a real effective practice. And uh, speaking of effective practices, I want to bring to your attention on the last page of your handout, 
the effective practices form. Uh, let us know about an effective practice that your courts instituted in working with multi-party cases. Uh, we'll compile them and give a copy to your clerk, chief probation uh, or pretrial officers, and the court training specialists. And uh, we think it's a great mechanism for sharing. Uh, we talked a little bit about lead attorneys and notice by uh, email. Let's move uh, forward a little bit and talk about selecting a jury in a multi-party case. Uh, Jim, what do you think are some of the challenges that court staff face uh, in dealing with selecting juries in a, in a multi-party case? Well, with multi-party cases, there are two things that are usually true in addition to there being many participants. One of those is that the trial can usually be expected to be a lengthy uh, matter rather than a two or three day trial that would be, be more typical in a civil case. Uh, the other thing that is generally true is that these are cases that have a higher public profile. There may be a great deal of media and public and community interest in the case. When both of those things are present, uh, that generally means you're going to have a more difficult time in the selection of a jury to sit in the trial of the case. It requires a significant amount of advanced planning uh, one of the things that our judges have, have come to use very often in these types of cases are pre-screening questionnaires. This allows us to send out questionnaires uh, sufficiently in advance of the trial. Uh, we have an opportunity to identify people who have uh, legitimate um, uh, conflicts with the dates that the trial is expected to be in progress. It also uh, allows us to identify people who are already in some fashion acquainted with the case in a way that would, would disqualify them so we don't end up bringing them in uh, and taking up the time of the voir dire th mm -hmm. that we can use on other people who, who meet the requirements in a, uh, for service on the case. But even, even when you use a technique like this, I think you have to anticipate that the jury selection is going to take a longer amount of time than it normally would. A multi-party case frequently could take two, sometimes three days to, to actually seat a jury. Uh, again, joining us uh, as one of our push to talk courts is Betsy Pere, uh, Chief Deputy for Administration of the District Court in the District of Columbia. Uh, Betsy, what are some of the practices your court has adopted in the selection of uh, a jury in a multi-party case? Bob, there are four techniques that we've um, adopted in this court. One is, as I mentioned in the first panel discussion, um, having a meeting with the judge as early in the, the, the practice the advance um, planning for the trial as possible, using the pre-screening questionnaire, use of a pre-voir dire questionnaire, and also managing voir dire. Um, here in Washington, D.C., we are a one-step court, so we mail out our jury summons and our jury qualifications questionnaires at the same time. We like to get eight weeks advance notice for high-profile trials or trials that are expected to last more than three weeks. Multi-party cases um, usually meet one or both of these criteria and we would identify these types of jury panels as specials. Um, the jury administrator and I would have already met with the judge well in advance of the, the trial actually starting to talk about jury issues. And at that meeting, we determine how many summons will be mailed, how many jurors the judge needs for voir dire, how many jurors the judge wants to serve, and how many alternate jurors will be needed. We determine if the judge would like to have a pre-screening questionnaire mailed out with the summons and the juror qualification form. And this questionnaire will advise the prospective jurors of the expected length of time that the trial will last and invites jurors to note any hardship issues that may prevent him or her from serving. And again, the trials are usually much, much longer than the regular trials that we're, that we're scheduling. When the completed juror qualification questionnaire and the request for excuses start coming in, the jury administrator will start sending the excuse request to the judge who will decide who will be excused and who will not. The attorneys, of course, have an opportunity to review the excuses and usually coordinate the time to do this with chambers. The jury administrator will also begin preparing weekly status reports for the judge advising him or her of the response rate and the number of qualified, disqualified, excused, deferred, and non-response jurors, as well as the mail that has been returned as undeliverable. This way, the jury administrator and the judge will know early in the process if it appears we might have trouble getting enough qualified jurors for the actual voir dire process and if we need to do a second mailing of summons. The judge um, may then want to have qualified jurors come in before voir dire begins to complete a lengthy pre-voir dire questionnaire that contains questions related to the substance of the case. The jury administrator would meet with the judge and make some recommendations as to how many people should come in, how many can be seated comfortably to complete forms, and how the process would work. Once the judges and the attorneys review the pre-voir dire questionnaires completed by the jurors, 
we will then, um, and we've already done this in advance, of course, um, talk to the judge about voir dire and what our recommendations would be for how that process should work. The judges usually um, ask the questions during the voir dire and limit the amount of talking the attorneys do. We always recommend that the judge limit the number of jurors who report to ensure that jurors are not kept waiting around too long. Usually we suggest 20 jurors in the morning and 20 in the afternoon. If the judge is moving quickly, we'll then adjust for the following day and bring in more people. And if things are taking longer, we'll adjust and call in fewer people in the morning, the following day, and in the afternoon. We have found that the judges appreciate getting our advice and hearing about our experiences with other specials before other judges. And as has been stated throughout this entire program, communication is key in every stage of the case, and this process is no exception. Thank you so much, Betsy. Colleen, is there anything else that you might add uh, regarding the care of jurors in a multi-party case? Well, Bob, as a courtroom deputy in a small divisional office, one of my responsibilities is to orient the jury. I review with the prospective jurors the type of case we're going to be conducting that day, the anticipated trial length, their conduct as jurors, and try to familiarize them with the court surroundings. For some people, this could be their very first time serving jury service. Another issue that we have to contend with in multi-party cases is there could be a lots of family members involved if it's a high-profile case or media coverage. Um, it seems the press loves to go to straight to the jury, so as a courtroom deputy, um, it's important that I be sensitive to who is coming in contact with the jury. Um, outside of dealing with the jury, uh, a courtroom deputy has coordination responsibilities. Um, such as to ensure that all the parties are in the courtroom um, when the judge is ready to take the bench. The more parties there are, the more difficult the task becomes. Sure. Uh, Jim, I know you're especially concerned about uh, first-time jurors and their responsibility, uh, especially uh, in, in a multi-party case. Well, I think we have to be concerned uh, the, about the fundamental fairness of the trial itself. And one of the things that I think jurors uh, are troubled by in a multi-party case is that they they understand when there's one side of a lawsuit and another side and that they listen to both sides and then proceed to their decision making. In a multi-party case, they may have to sit through days and days and days of testimony from one party and followed by a series of other parties. And I think jurors sometimes uh, get confused about you know, when, when the trial is going to be concluded and at what point they can start mentally making up their own minds. One of the things I do when I conduct a jury orientation is to remind jurors that it is their solemn obligation to listen attentively to the last party who has the opportunity to present evidence to them just as they did to the first party even though they may be freshest and most interested in the trial process at the very beginning of the case I think they have to understand that these cases are a little bit more demanding on their attention span than, that, than, than a regular case right. might be. Right, still communication and coordination exactly. those key elements. Um, Angela, speaking of coordination, you're responsible really for operating the technology in the two electronic courtrooms that uh, uh, exist in the District of Columbia, making sure that whoever needs to see the exhibits uh, sees them mm -hmm. uh, when they're supposed to see them, has access. When dealing with multiple parties, um, what do you find as the, the greatest challenge? It must really keep you on your toes. Oh, it does. The biggest challenge was um, getting over the fear of that courtroom and uh, just buckling down and learning how to use the equipment for myself. Um, the electronic courtroom saves a lot of time because photos that are admitted, for example, no longer have to be passed around to each and every juror. With the use of the um, Exhibit 1 system, which we call the ELMO, which is the click of a button, everyone can see the exhibit. Also, um, the comprehension of the jurors has increased. They now can hear and see the exhibit at the same time, and I think that has been a great asset. Um, witnesses now can testify right from the witness stand. They no longer have to step down to point things out on, on the exhibit because they can use an annotator, which we call a um, John Madden pen. Okay, and for those of us who are not great fans of, uh, of uh, professional football, the Madden pen is? Well, the Madden pen, <laughs> is, if you do watch football, um, you see uh, John Madden would always draw little arrows and little lines and circles of what he was trying of different plays and that's what the witness can do they can draw little arrows and lines around certain things that they're testifying to. Uh, Colleen you also use uh, the evidence presentation systems in, uh, in multi-party cases what do you think of the advantages of these, uh, these systems? Well technology has certainly become an important tool in today's courtroom um, unlike Angela the courtroom that is generally used in, in our location is an older co courtroom that has been somewhat retrofitted retrofitted. 
Um, we presently are using the Dewar presenter, which is similar to the ELMO system that Angela just mentioned. I find it interesting that the first trial we use this equipment in, which happened to be a death penalty case, that after the trial, the government informed me um, that this not only helped them present their case faster, but by not having to make several duplicate copies of photographs that were necessary for them to do so, that that savings alone had paid for the entire cost of the equipment. Uh, so the cost saving obviously was tremendous. Outside of the cost effectiveness, I believe that the use of this technology really helps a jury to follow along during the course of trial um, when testimony and evidence is being presented because they can follow along uh, the points that the attorneys may be making um, as it relates to a particular exhibit. They're seeing it, they're hearing the testimony, and, and I think it sticks in their minds a little bit more um, overall for the case. Right. Uh, again, with uh, logistics, um, um, let's turn our attention to uh, uh, dealing with exhibits. And uh, we have on the line here one of our push to talk courts, the district court from the Southern District of California. Ray Blanchard, I believe you're there. How do you deal with uh, all the exhibits that uh, exist in a multi party case? Yes, Bob. Good, good, after, good, good morning from San Diego. Let me put a plug in from America's finest city to begin with. <laughs> Some of our courts here uh, require the attorneys to uh, put their exhibits in binders when there's plenty of them being used for trial, and they bring in the binders in. Some of them put them on uh, bookshelves, and some of them put them on carts and then bring the carts into the courtroom. And let me first of all say that some of our newer courtrooms have exhibit uh, book cabinets that they put the exhibits in which are locked up, you know, during the day or at nighttime when the court is not in session. Not all the courtrooms are outfitted that way, but we're in the process of getting them. Contraband is not kept in the courtroom at any time, either marijuana, drugs, or weapons of any kind. Uh, basically, that's about it. <laughs> okay, th thank you, Ray. Colleen, how does your court deal with uh, space challenges as a result of exhibits in multi-party cases? Well, just previously, um, as mentioned, space is always a limiting factor when dealing with multi-party uh, trials. Due to the number of the p people involved, the boxes of exhibits, demonstrative evidence, and other materials the attorneys um, need during the course of trial can really constrain your working environment. Um, in a recent trial we conducted, one exhibit alone took the entire well area of our courtroom. So that was quite challenging. Um, however, with the use of technology and the attorney's growing knowledge of how to utilize it, um, I believe it will help eliminate the amount of materials they bring into the court because instead of bringing boxes and upon boxes of materials, evidence, um, th it can now be reduced to the simple size of a mm -hmm. CD-ROM. Mm -hmm. Well, speaking of technology and, and exhibits, Angela, one of the challenges, or well, I should say one of the great things about technology is you can have instant access for, to information. One of the challenges, obviously, is that everybody wants it right away, and uh, I'll have to assume that the press is no, uh, no exception to that. Well, how do you deal with uh, the press wanting uh, access to all this information in multi-party cases? Well, you're right. The press wants it even faster now. Um, we, we just had two trials where the press did want the exhibits as soon as they were admitted. And what we can do, um, the attorneys can pro provide copies of the exhibits to the press, or um, the attorneys can provide copies of the exhibits to our vending service and they will make copies and then notify the, uh, the press and they can come and pick them up, of course, for a small fee. The clerk's office just does not have the resources to provide copy so work. That's, that's mm -hmm. a real challenge. It is a I challenge. To say, yeah. um, let's hear from another of uh, our Push to Talk participants, uh, back again to the District of Columbia, uh, Joe Burgess. Uh, what would you emphasize as one of the challenges you face in dealing with multi-party cases once in trial? Good afternoon. Hi, Joe. Uh, challenges that I think that are major are keeping the courtroom deputy alert and keeping the courtroom deputy from getting burnout. After being in trial for many hours a day and for many months, the courtroom deputy gets tired. So I suggest the solution is to make sure that the operations manager keep a handle on the uh, courtroom deputy to make sure they're not getting burnout and to make sure they get relief when they need it. And another thing about being alert, the marshals, although we have them in the courtroom, the courtroom deputy also has to keep an eye op open to see what's going on. We've had witnesses 
be intimidated. We've had uh, jurors be intimidated by the audience. And the courtroom deputy has to be an assistant. So those are the things that I think that are challenges to a courtroom deputy. Uh, has, to be, uh, has to be attentive and also notify the judge, I'm sure, uh, uh, when something happens, right? That's correct, Bob. Uh, Angela, reactions to what Joe has said? Uh, well, um, um, what Joe has just said is true. We, uh, in the District of Columbia, we have some very experienced courtroom deputies. We have some that have been here 15, even 30 years. So not only do we have burnout, but we also have leave as an issue. And when the judges are in trial all the time, it is difficult to find the time for them to be able to take off and use up their leave. So um, Joe is actually my uh, co-operations manager. So together we try to, uh, if, if that means we go to court for them so that they can get off, we'll do that. Um, we try, uh, Joe actually has something called a buddy system on his, on his unit. I don't have it done on my side. But uh, what, we, what we do, um, there are a lot of times I have volunteers that say, I'll do the paperwork and you just focus on the trial. So that mm -hmm. has been a big help. Um, the one thing, and I think Joe would agree with me, is as operation managers, we have to be creative and sensitive to the needs of our courtroom deputies because months and months in trial can really burn you out. Um, um, Colleen, in the, in the Northern District of New York, you've developed a mentoring program. Uh, can you explain a little bit about that? Well, just as Angela just raised, um, protracted trials can be very demanding um, on a courtroom deputy. So what our district has done is we've developed a mentoring program which allows a seasoned individual such as a courtroom uh, deputy uh, to take an individual and give them step-by-step in-depth training um, on how to handle the duties and responsibilities of a courtroom deputy. From a courtroom deputy standpoint, this is great because it certainly frees me up during the course of trial um, to get away from the courtroom and to address other issues on other matters that can't be handled while I'm sitting in trial. And Jim, you have another different, even a different practice in the Eastern District of Missouri, if you could explain that. Sure. I certainly agree that uh, having one person uh, staffing a, tr a lengthy trial can be very tedious and exhausting, and I think we have to take steps to try to guard against that. Our approach in the Eastern District of Missouri, however, has been to um, essentially abolish the position, the separate position of courtroom deputy. Our judges are served by case management teams consisting of three persons, who are fully cross-trained and cross-functional so that they, able to, they are able to perform all of the support services that the judge is going to need, whether the judge is in trial or not in trial. That allows us maximum flexibility to interchange people from the case management team into the courtroom whenever necessary, and it also gives the judge what amounts to a back office support so that other matters that are, that are pending before the judge are still getting appropriate attention because there are two other people in the team who can keep up with things that are going on yeah. in the unit. And keep in mind, with the system that, that we have in the Eastern District of Missouri, the judge is not concerned about seeing strangers in his courtroom who may or may not understand how to conduct courtroom proceedings. The people who are serving the judge in this capacity are all trained to perform the courtroom support mm -hmm. role. Mm -hmm. It's two great examples of, uh, of effective practices meeting a real challenge. Uh, Judy, I understand that you have a question or a fax that came in. Yes, Bob, I do. As a matter of fact, we have two faxes. Um, the first one starts with a question for Jim. Uh, Jim, I know St. Louis is building a new courthouse. What accommodations have you made to take care of your multi-party cases? And then a question for Colleen and Angela. What's happened in retrofitted courts? Well, I do think we are much better prepared in the new Thomas Eagleton Courthouse in St. Louis, which we will be occupying uh, this summer we are much better prepared to accommodate multi-party cases. For one thing, we've increased the size of the well in every courtroom, so there is more room now for additional numbers of parties, council tables if we need to bring them in. Uh, all of these courtrooms also have the infrastructure for courtroom technology, and while we're not planning to equip every courtroom with evidence presentation technology, the systems we have are a rollabout feature we can roll them into any courtroom where these types of equipment will be helpful in a multi-party case. We also have much better security systems in place that have been a real concern in our existing courthouse, particularly in multiple defendant criminal cases. Uh, the security systems are now state of the art in the new St. Louis courthouse. And I think the, the last thing that we, that we are very proud of is a uh, ceremonial courtroom that will also serve as a courtroom to accommodate larger trials 
the exceptionally large trial. It's a 3,000 square foot courtroom. It has a greatly increased well uh, that will allow us to accommodate virtually any kind of case that would come up. We also have the ability to enhance security in that particular courtroom in ways that we cannot in the other courtrooms. So th those are some of the things that we've done in St. Louis to try to, to uh, bring online a new courthouse that will really enable us to deal very effectively with multi-party cases. Colleen. Um, well, what we've done in our divisional office is that we have um, basically the presenter equipment, the dual equipment, is on a freestanding cart. That equipment is very mobile in the courtroom. Um, we do have TV monitors that are set up throughout the courtroom. So that's basically how it's been retrofitted. However, I know that as new courtrooms are being built within the district, that the, um, the electronic courtrooms are now starting to be developed. Mm -hmm. So we, they'll already be incorporated in the courtroom. Angela, would you add something to that? Um, it's just like Colleen's, we have mobile systems. The only thing we had to do to prepare for that was upgrade our sound system. And um, the only thing that's different from our two electronic courtrooms is each juror does not have monitors, but it works the same. Okay, great. Um, we just about have a minute left, and that's all in, in this. So if we just going to want to go around, Jim, let me start with you for just a, a quick final thought. I think the point we've been trying to make in this segment is that the presence of multiple parties uh, affects almost every dimension of a case from start to finish, but I think more particularly it affects the conduct of a trial. Mm -hmm. Our job is to try to anticipate where we're going to have to apply special procedures, consult with the judge about what's going to work best, and then apply those solutions. Uh, and uh, the goal is to try to avoid any unexpected surprises that are related to the logistics of mm -hmm. those kinds of cases. Colleen. I believe that technology and automation in the courtroom has proven to be a definite benefit during the course of trial. We hope to see the bar start familiarizing themselves uh, with technology available to them as it can really enhance the quality of the case being presented. Great. Angela, you have the final word. Um, that is important if you do have lead counsel to, to let lead counsel be the focus point and that's so that the courtroom deputies can focus on other duties that they have assigned to them and that if you're fortunate enough to have electronic courtroom to use it, become familiar with it because it is a great asset for the courts. Great, thank you. Uh, I want to thank our second panel and the Push to Talk participants and thanks to everybody for your participation. As we get ready for our last panel, we'll leave you with some of the challenges and practices we've just discussed. Before we move into our last segment, one note of interest here. You heard Colleen speak on New York Northern's mentoring and cross-training program. While Court to Court will be paying a visit to Syracuse to tape their story, you can learn more about their innovative program on Court to Court's either October or January broadcast. Watch the FJTN Bulletin for details. Thanks again for your faxes, and please keep them coming in. Now it's time for our last panel. It is our practice to uh, process JNCs, that's judgment and commitments, within 24 hours. Um, if you sentence five or six defendants in one day, that's not going to happen. It's very important uh, to have the expertise of the probation office in ruling on any of these sentencing and pre-sentence report questions. My law clerks really, uh, I do not utilize to get into these questions. I'm going to rely upon probation. Uh, they have training, they have constant updates, they get updated on our circuit law constantly about what issues there are in pre-sentence reports, and I really do 
uh, expect to rely on the probation office to give me the advice that I want. The FJC, the Federal Judicial Center, puts out some great materials. There's a book on complex litigation, civil litigation, which is very helpful. There are books on managing complex criminal trials, which are very helpful. The nice thing about the federal judiciary is everyone's seen it before, and if you haven't, someone out there has, and always is willing to share advice, counsel, and guidance um, to make the process easier for you. Post-trial issues is the topic uh, of the moment, and I'd like to welcome back Rick Hout, Kathy Gould Feldman, Angela Cesar Mobley, and Jim Woodward. Uh, he will talk about some of the challenges that court staff face when working with multi-party cases once a trial has been completed. Again, we encourage you to participate, ask questions, and share your thoughts with us. We still have a lot of time left, so keep those cards and letters coming. Uh, Rick, let's start with you. In the segment's opening clip, uh, Judge Lamberth refers to his reliance on the expertise of the probation office to deal with pre-sentence report uh, questions and also objections from attorneys. How does that work? Well, first, Bob, let me express my appreciation for Judge Lamberth and the judges of the District of Columbia who uh, respect, support, and enforce our critical role as independent uh, players in the sentencing process. Our role is defined by Rule 32 of the Federal Rules of Criminal Procedure, Sentencing Commission guidelines, local and national policy. But it is the requirements of the district judge that really set our practices mm -hmm. for their court. Judge Lamberth charges us with determining to the best of our ability uh, the facts of what happened, separate and apart from any agreements or stipulations that the parties may have entered into. Determinations about actual events and culpability are critical in multi-defendant cases. It is important to determine an individual defendant's role in the offense for guideline calculations, uh, restitution information, and victim information. Uh, the offense uh, that is under consideration um, is uh, it, it's critical that we determine um, what the co-defendant's actual role was because some may have pled to lesser offenses or they may have entered into agreements that distort actual events. Mm -hmm. Our report is prepared in draft and is circulated to counsel to disclose contents and solicit objections. Further investigation may be warranted and we attempt to resolve all issues prior to sentencing. In, um, uh, in those issues that have not been resolved, we try to clearly present those to the judge so that he can or she can determine those at the time of sentence. How do you coordinate all this? Uh, I would imagine, especially with multi-party cases, you must be under some mighty tight deadlines. I indeed we are. Uh, as Judge Lamberth had said about a lead attorney, it's useful for us to assign a lead probation officer to coordinate critical elements in the investigation. Communicating with the many parties reliably and regularly and keeping the judge informed is also critical. Our timeline is set by a local rule and Rule 32 of the Federal Rules of Criminal Procedure. This gives us about 70 days to prepare the report. Between 35 and 45 days is required to come up with the first draft. Mm -hmm. We disclose that to the parties and then they have 10 days to respond. We make sure that we investigate and clarify any issues and then provide a final report to the court at least five days prior to sentencing. We have local databases to keep us informed and also to hold us accountable for that timeline. Objections and issues first brought up at sentencing can be showstoppers, as you can imagine, yeah, and are, are to be avoided in multi-party cases. Uh, and we attempt to avoid such situations by actively encouraging objections before we get to that stage. Also in the District of Columbia, we have something called a five-day order, which um, commands a response from delinquent uh, parties uh, and makes sure that the uh, sentencing requirements are met. Again, communication and coordination. Indeed. Uh, Angela, I understand that it's an effective practice in the District Court in the District of Columbia to sentence one defendant per day. Uh, why do you believe that's such an effective practice? I believe that in the District of Columbia, we sentence only one defendant per day in multi-party cases for security reasons. Um, we, uh, it's, if we have a multi-party case and say one defendant decides to enter plea of guilty and the others go to trial, and say on that sentencing day, um, family members are going to be present, other defendants may be present if they're on PR or whatever, um, security issues could rise. If mm -hmm. you hear that so-and-so is going to get 
three years and someone else is going to get maybe 120 months, I'm sure that um, it could cause a great, a uh, lot of trouble. So we try to do it for security reasons. Also, as Rick mentioned earlier, the probation office has 70 days to prepare their pre-sentence report. So um, a lot of times I think we uh, do this to accommodate the probation office so that they can get their reports timely to uh, the we judges. We appreciate that. <laughs> Uh, Jim, in the Eastern District of Missouri, do you have a similar practice of sentencing one uh, party per day? Uh, th there is no formal practice of limiting sentencings in multi-party defendant cases to one per day. Um, more often, these kinds of matters are clustered under sentencings on, on a few days, and there may be defendants from the same case sentenced on the same day. However, our judges certainly are very concerned about some of the security issues that can arise by having defendants, co-defendants from the same case present in the courtroom or family members present in the courtroom. But a sort of different effective practice that one of our judges has developed that helps deal with the issue that Rick mentioned about the judge needing to understand where everybody is in the case, what sentencing alternatives are available, and what sentencing ranges were actually imposed. One of our judges has developed a multi-party matrix document that she uses to display every, the name and defense counsel of every defendant in a multi-party case. This document is created the, at the beginning of the case and it is updated at every stage of the case all the way up to and including trial if there are any for any of the defendants. So the judge knows at a glance when sentencing defendant number six that what sentence has already been imposed, which defendants, co-defendants have pled, uh, what the sentencing range and the sentencing options are for each and every one of the defendants in the case. It has become a very effective tool for the judge to have a panoramic view of the status of every party in a multi-party defendant oh, I bet case. It is. Yeah. I bet it is. Um, let me stay with you for a minute, uh, Jim. Some folks think that, thinks that, I think that once sentencing finally occurs in a multi-party case, then uh, that's the end of all business. But uh, actually, there's quite a flurry of activity that occurs in the, uh, in the clerk's office. Can you explain yeah. that? Well, certainly the public part of the process is generally concluded when the trial is over, if there are any trials in a multi-defendant case, but certainly when the sentencing is over. But there, there is a burst of activity that occurs in the clerk's office that's uh, quite apart from the, the courtroom proceedings. And, of course, the most significant part of that is the preparation of multiple judgment and commitment orders. Um, these are probably one of the most important legal documents that we prepare in the clerk's office, and we, we want to make sure that they're done accurately and that they're consistent with the decisions that the judge has made as reflected in the courtroom. That often requires that we have to have contact with the probation officer who prepared the report. Sometimes it means calling the law clerk or even the judge to get some interpretation about something that was said in the courtroom that may not be entirely clear that has to be reflected in the document. We also strive for a 24-hour turnaround on the completion of a judgment and commitment order, although in a multi-party case sometimes that's difficult to achieve. With our case management teams, though, we're very, it's very easy for us to bring the resources to bear to get the assistance with the preparation of those documents mm -hmm. on very short notice. But I, I would say that if, if we are unable to complete the document in 24 hours, we're certainly more interested in having it be accurate and correct than having it be fast. Oh, sure, absolutely. Oh, we received a phone call mm -hmm. um, for uh, mm -hmm. Rick's comment, so uh, uh, welcome. Do we have our phone call? That's okay. <laughs> um, having to do with dealing with multi-defendant cases. Um, basically what we've met as a challenge in our district is the whole issue of coordinating the balance when you have a number of co-defendants in terms of trying to determine the various roles, the culpability, the offense data itself, and making sure that there's some sort of consistency with the recommendations and we dealt with this for a number of years, and basically uh, what we have worked out that seems to work for us is that if it's at all possible to assign all the co-defendants to either one or two partners working in tandem so that there's minimal contact with the uh, U.S. Attorney's Office in terms of um, getting the data from them, and then also making sure that, that the officers, if there's two, they work in tandem in terms of gathering the data, in terms of laying out the roles of the various co-defendants, the, the various culpabilities, and making sure that the offense data is uniform for all cases. This has worked out well. The judges, the judges have commented favorably on this because it presents a uniform <laughs> approach. And uh, we basically found that, that this works generally uh, with all the multi-defendant cases in our district. And I just wanted to uh, pass that on. 
That's Thank great. you very much. Yeah. And that's consistent with yeah. our lead um, probation officer concept. Thanks for calling in. That's a great effective practice. And uh, if anyone else has any other uh, effective practices they want to call in or fax and do let us know. Uh, Angela, I just want to turn uh, uh, our attention to uh, the disposal of exhibits in a multi-party case. Uh, uh, what do you do in the District of Columbia? As soon as it's over, we give them back to the attorney. <laughs> uh, we just do not have the space to store the exhibits. So as soon as the case is over, the attorneys sign for them and they take them. Now, if they're bulky and they can't take them all the same day, we do make arrangements for them to pick them up the next morning. Because if the Court of Appeals needs the um, exhibits, they can contact counsel to, and uh, counsel will get the exhibits to the Court of Appeals. But if it's a bench trial, we do hold on to the exhibits until the judge has made a ruling, just in mm -hmm. case they need mm -hmm. to make reference to the exhibits. Okay. Kathy, we've been hearing a lot about the district side. What's happening on the bankruptcy? Uh, what happens on the bankruptcy side of the, uh, the House uh, after an adversary case has been decided? Well, Bob, adversary cases, even if they involve multi-parties, are not as exciting as uh, criminal cases in the no. district court. <laughs> and they rarely take more than one or two days to try. However, multi-party cases can be a challenge, especially to the courtroom deputy who is responsible for managing exhibits during and after trial. And as others have already alluded to uh, today, exhibits, exhibit storage space is definitely an issue when you're dealing with multi-party cases. Mm -hmm. As I mentioned earlier, our court issues a pretrial scheduling order when the case is filed. And this order requires the parties to submit pre-marked exhibits either at the calendar call or two days prior to trial if the case is specially set. And uh, the plaintiff's exhibits, the order also sets forth that plaintiff's exhibits must be marked numerically and defendant's exhibits alphabetically. And then they must be bound and tabbed in a notebook or folder with copies served on all parties. And this is all done um, at least two days prior to trial. When they are submitted to the court, they must also be accompanied by a local form of an exhibit register, which is attached as an exhibit to that pretrial scheduling order mm -hmm. that I referred to earlier. Right. So this requirement facilitates the management of exhibits during trial, especially when there are multiple defendants, and then assists the courtroom deputy after trial in returning exhibits when the appeal time has, um, has run. We also have an effective local rule dealing with exhibit disposal, and that provides for the return of exhibits upon written request of a party, stating that no appeal has, is pending and that the matter is final. The party must supply an adequate sized envelope or box or whatever it takes to get those exhibits packed up and mailed back, or they must make arrangements to come and pick them up in person. After a certain period, if their exhibits are not claimed, the local rule um, authorizes the courtroom deputy to automatically dispose of them without further notice to the parties. Okay. I think your court is on the line again via push to talk. Uh, uh, Joe Falzone? Yes, I'm here. Thanks. Uh, I think uh, in, in, to supplement what Kathy has said, uh, effective practices start with established in-house uh, procedures, procedures for processing trial exhibits, uh, procedures for docketing and transmitting the record, and procedures for tracking and disposing of the matter. Uh, it's certainly all necessary steps for effective practices. Thanks so much. Um, let's just take a brief moment now to go around the table and summarize some of the main points discussed uh, in this final uh, uh, panel. Uh, Rick, let's start with you. Well, each of us has a critical role to play in uh, helping the court deal with multiple party cases. I think it's very important that we maintain productive relationships and communication to help us effectively deploy our resources to mm -hmm. support the court adequately. Mm -hmm. Angela. Um, I think that communication is a key among the units. And most importantly, I think it's important that everyone has an appreciation for each other's job. True. Kathy? Well, from a bankruptcy court's perspective, again, uh, by establishing an effective practice for managing exhibits, it facilitates exhibit management during trial. In fact, our, in our court, the courtroom deputies rarely sit in trial to manage the exhibits. And then post-trial, it helps the case manager if she or he is faced with preparing multiple records on appeal and multiple uh, designations. And finally, it assists the courtroom deputy to easily identify and return exhibits quickly post-trial when the appeal time has run. Okay, Jim, we'll turn it over to you. What have we missed? Well, I think we've done a pretty good job of covering some of the issues that are, that are very likely to occur in a multiple party case. And uh, we've offered a few suggestions. Uh, I think this is an opportunity for court staffs to be creative about coming up with solutions that will meet the need in any particular case. And the solutions don't always have to be sophisticated or expensive. They can be as simple as 
creating a seating chart for the well of the courtroom that you can pass to the judge so the judge knows who's seated where. And that's also a useful tool for the court reporter who has mm -hmm. to keep track of change of speakers. Um, so those are some simple examples. Uh, but I think the thing that we need to realize is that uh, very often the solutions for these problems, we have to reach across division lines, sometimes even outside of the clerk's office, and get cooperation and assistance from all of the players in the process. Uh, because the, in order to professionally administer some of these cases, they have to become everybody's concern. Right. Mm -hmm. Judy, I understand you have a fax. Yes, Bob. We, as a matter of fact, we've had a couple, but they're all asking basically the same thing, uh, which is, do you have some of this information and practices documented on your websites, or can we email you? How can we obtain more information? Well, let's go around the table. Well, Jim. the Eastern District of Missouri has a website that we um, maintain and update on a, on a regular basis. It's available through the JNET and also mm -hmm. just through a, a web browser. One of the, probably one of the most useful features of the website is that our judges each have posted a judge's requirements section. Mm -hmm. And it is there where the judge spells out very specific requirements that are usually unique to that court um, that the judge requires attorneys to understand and, to, and the judge expects the, the attorneys to mm -hmm. follow those uh, basic guidelines when preparing a case for trial. Great information, isn't it? It can be Great helpful. Great information for attorneys. Yes. Kathy. Well, uh, our website should be up shortly. But in the meantime, you can get all of our local rules, our forms um, that I've alluded to today uh, off of PACER. You can also get them if you want to email me. My email address is Katherine, K-A-T-H-E-R-I-N-E underscore Gould, G-O-U-L-D, at flsb.uscourts.gov. Okay, thank you. Angela. The District of Columbia does have a website. We have selected opinions, court schedules, local rules, and general information. Rick? The Probation Office has a website that we'll make available to the intranet on June 1st, and uh, I'm easily available through the directory, so please feel free to uh, email me. Great. Uh, we'll take some of our remaining time to open it up for questions if uh, any of our participants have questions out there. Anything? Bob, uh, I'd like to ask a question of Angela, if I may, please. Sure. Could you identify yourself? This is Jeff Reinert from the Southern District of Alabama. Angela, Hi, I heard you mention uh, recent, recently we've uh, lost our criminal appeals clerk, and so I'm doing some of those duties. And one of the things that uh, you said was that on exhibits that you give them all back after trial. And did I hear you say the Court of Appeals then would request those exhibits from the parties? That's correct. And I, I, because the Court of Appeals is located in the same building with us, it works great. Um, either the attorneys can bring them into us, and we'll get them upstairs to the Court of Appeals, or they can take them directly to the Court of Appeals. We just do not have the space to store exhibits. Now that does make it nice since they're in the same building. Right. Thank you very much. <laughs> That's right. Thanks for the question, Jeff. Uh, we're just about out of time, and um, so I want to close this session. Now, we've tried today to, to consider some of the challenges that court staff uh, I have to deal with when working with multi-party cases. We've examined it from the aspects of preparing for trial, during trial, and finally post-trial issues. Uh, you've heard about how important planning and coordination and communication activities are, and also the effective practices that some of our panelist courts, as well as some of our Push to Talk uh, and others have instituted. I hope this has been a, a helpful and positive learning experience for you. Uh, I'd like to thank our panelists uh, around here today our push to talk sites. Uh, your participation, I think, really brought home some uh, positive points to consider. And thanks to all of our participants. We hope you found today's broadcast useful. We'll pause for a moment to review some of the challenges and effective practices that we covered in this final segment, and then it's back to Judy Roberts for some final words.
That's all the time we have for today. To those who still have questions to be answered and comments to be made, remember if there is interest, we can continue the discussion in a fall online conference. Please contact Bob Fagan for more details. Remember to fax in your participant rosters and evaluations because we need your feedback as we plan additional FJTN programs. Thanks for participating and sharing your challenges and effective practices today when working with multi-parties. Don't forget to fax us your effective practice. The form is in our participant materials on jnet.fjc.dcn. However, there are no warranties or guarantees with any of the practices described today, but some of them might just work for you or could be adapted for your court. As you continue to improve communication, service, and operations in your court units, we think it's important to remember what Justice Souter said at his confirmation hearing before the Senate. He said that no matter what court we are working in, at the end of our task, some human being is going to be affected, some human life is going to be changed, and we had better use every power of our hearts and minds and beings to get our rulings right. Those words apply to all of us in all the work we do. Thank you for joining us today.